Hello, my name is AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida. And, uh, you know, I wanted to bring you today a re-examination of a really famous game of chess. This is the game between Garry Kasparov and Alexei Shirov from Horgan, 1994. This was a big chess tournament that was uh, held in uh, the business di district of Zurich, Switzerland in 1994. It was a tremendous tournament. Uh, all the best players, or some of the best players, uh, you know, of that time period played in that tournament. Uh, a couple of legends, Gary Kasparov, Shirov, uh, Korchnoi was there, and he had a really good tournament. Um, he he almost picked up almost 100 points and uh, had one of his better tournaments in a long time. So um, it's just a great tournament. Uh, a lot of the games from that tournament, I have played through many of the games from that tournament. They're all fantastic games. And uh, this game in itself is, is very important. Gary Kasparov, or some people say Kasparov, but I believe Kasparov is correct. Uh, Gary Kasparov played really great chess in this game. I mean, in, uh, in the whole tournament, he played very well. In this game in particular, he played a, a sacrifice, a positional exchange sacrifice, and many people hailed it as one of the finest creations uh, ever thought up on the chessboard. I mean, they just, you know, literally just were gushing over this game and uh you know it was it was a lot of people said a lot of things about this game it was vo voted as the uh, by all the other grandmasters this is a vote chosen by the other you know um people on the panel uh, they chose this as the very best game of informant number 61 um however i wanted to do a re-examination of this game um, it's based on not feeling or prejudice. A lot of it has to do with, well, first of all, when I had first saw this game, I had some reservations about the sacrifice itself. Um, it appeared to me that White had a lot of compensation for it, but whether or not it was a forced win, I sort of doubted that. And, um, you know, I'm just a national master, so my ability to, you know, challenge grandmasters you know, in 1994 just wasn't there. I mean, you know, I was a pretty good analyst. I've always been known as a fair analyst. But still, you know, I mean, I don't think that I had the uh, tools or the capability. And it, without chess engines, I wouldn't have that capability today. But um, today, chess engines have advanced today to the point to where they're so powerful and they're so strong that uh, any chess engine will beat just about any living player, you know, on, on, even on their best day. You know, the best a human can do is hope for is, is a draw. And we've already seen too many human versus machine matches for anyone with any common sense to argue otherwise. So, you know, based on a lot of engine research and a lot of, you know, work I've done with all the engines, and I've used a lot of engines on this game. I've used uh, Fritz 13. I've used Houdini 3. I've used Deep Shredder. I've used Deep Junior. I've used... Yeah, I could go on all day about all the engines, uh, you know, uh, Stockfish, uh, you know, just engine after engine after engine. I tried to test literally every engine that I could get my hands on or think of uh, and run it by. And I also have a former student. He has a brand new PC. Uh, he just got it just this year, just, just about a month ago. And he has the very latest version of, um, he has dual processors. It has basically two uh, chips on the motherboard. It has two thinking chips on the motherboard. Very expensive setup. Uh, very nice PC, and he has the latest version of Ribka, and he was kind enough to run this uh, through especially several critical points where I said I wanted very deep analysis, you know, and, and maybe the computer to run for, say, five or ten hours, like overnight while he was sleeping, uh, do DP, DPAs, deep positional analysis uh, with the computer, and some sliding as well, and he was kind enough to do a lot of that for me and send it to me, so uh, I think that I have a fairly good look at this uh, game and also too I consulted all the books there's about this game is already in about a dozen books so I wanted to make sure that I checked all the resources and looked at all the games and and tried to uh, you know be fair about it too but anyway without any further ado we're going to jump into this game this is the game Gary Kasparov uh, he was rated 2805 versus Alexei Shirov 2740 again this is from the Horgan tournament played in 1994 and uh, it, we're just going to go ahead and jump into the game. It begins as a Sicilian. Uh, Gary opens with his king pawn, and Shirov counters with his with the uh, queen bishop pawn, making it a Sicilian. E, f the first move is one e4, c5, two knight f3, e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6. And this is a pretty standard, uh, uh, you know, position. 
for you know a, a lot of you know just a standard Sicilian type of position where Black plays e6 instead of d6. He has the possibility of d5. Gary goes ahead and plays knight bd5, threatening to stick a knight in there on the d6 square. Naturally, sure I was not going to allow that. Now White plays bishop f4, and now we have e5, and basically that's just a transposition. Um, you know, it's possible to reach reach this this position. You know, with with uh, one one move less actually. For example, well, I don't have to give you the moves. You can just find it in ECO. But you know, e5 can happen in one jump. So that in that in those lines, you know, there's actually one less move in the move count. But anyway, we have e5. We have a transposition, and now White plays uh, eight bishop to g5, and this is the Veshnikov Sicilian. Um, it, you know. Pioneered by a player, Evgeny Veshnikov. Uh, he's a Soviet master, brilliant mind. Um, you know, when he first started playing this line, I will say, you know, a lot of people made fun of it. I mean, it wasn't accepted at all, but he won a lot of games with it. And finally, a lot of masters finally came around to his way of thinking. And today, you know, this, this line can be found in the, in the uh, uh, repertoires of many top GMs. So anyway, Black goes ahead and plays A6. Knight a3, b5. And this is the main line, I believe, of the, the uh, Veshnikov. I have about a dozen books, maybe more on this line. And um, it's uh, called the Chelyabinsk variation. That's what one book called it anyway. And this is the main line here. And this was all the rage in GM chess for about 15 to 20 years. And it's still being played today, though. I will say that its popularity has faded somewhat. There's not near as many games as there were, say, just 5 or 10 years ago. I don't know why that is. I mean, I think it's just a fashion thing. I don't think there's any valid reason for that. There's still some uh, grandmasters out there like Mamed Yardov, Mamed Yardov and a few others that, that play this line on a regular basis. White plays knight d5. That's a positional kind of uh, line there. Um, you know, another line there is that white can play, you know, the immediate uh, bishop e6. That's an older line. But anyway, going, well, wait a minute. Let's just run through that line since I already clicked on it. Bishop e6, knight c4, rook c8. Bishop takes f6, g takes f6, knight e3, bishop h6. And black has fair play there, uh, although white has, you know, a nice grip on the light squares. Maybe that's why grandmasters no longer play this line. But anyway, let's just go back to our game here. That's just an alternative there. e4, c5, knight f3, e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, Knight c6, 6 knight db, knight at d to b5, d6, bishop f4, e5, bishop g5, a6, knight a3, b5. Of course, this is the main line with a move extra normally because normally a lot of grandmasters, you know, play it with just e5 there. But uh, since we've added a move here because we went first to e6 and then later to e5, there's actually an extra move in the, in the move count. But this is a Chelyabinsk variation. Some of the specialists from the black side of this particular opening would be Carlson and Kramnik and Rajabov, Mehmed Yardov, and, and Gelfan, just to name a few. And Shirov, of course, has played it a number of times. Now, White here, like I said, White, can, White has several uh, alternatives here. One of the main lines, a very sharp line, is Bishop takes 6, G takes F, F6, Knight D5, F5. That's uh, you know one of the main lines there. Play can become very wild, but both sides have good play. But uh, just backing up here, in this line, after b5, black plays b5 there on move uh, 9, or normally that's move 8. Now white plays knight d5. This is the positional kind of slow line there. Uh, the main idea here is just to simply, you know, dominate the light square, stick the knight in the outpost. And basically, I think, you know, the idea is to basically try to squeeze black to death. The first time that I saw this played, it was played by the then world champion, a Natalie Karpov back in the early 70s and even on into the eight, early 80s and late 1970s and early 1980s. And Karpov is white, won some very impressive games with it. But anyway, knight d5, this is the main line, bishop e7, bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6. Again, we're seeing a positional concept here. Basically, uh, the reason that white took on f6 was not so as not to lose tempo and also the idea is to undermine you know black's ability to challenge white's knight outpost on the d5 square white plays 12 c3 again these are all mainline book lines and now black plays bishop b7 that's probably not the main line today i have like i said i've got just about every book 
on the Veshnikov, I think there is. And I also have a brand new DVD here by GM Loic Van Willey. And the main line today would probably be 12 castles. And this is a line that comes right out of the Encyclopedia of Chess Openings. And it's also found in MCO. And also GM Eager Stoll said that that was better than what was played in the game than 12 bishop b7. And the main line here, just briefly running through that, is knight c2, bishop g5, a4, b takes a4, rook takes a4, a5, bishop c4, rook b8, b3, king h8, and white castles. And that's the main line you can find literally. If you search that uh, position, you're going to find, you know, dozens of grandmaster games, you know, with that position. A very famous example would be Ivan Chuck Carlson from the Tal Memorial in, in Moscow, 2007. They drew that game, but it took close to 100 moves. But anyway, we're just going to back up here to the last couple of moves. 10 bishop e7, just so you can keep track of the game. 11 bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, c3, bishop b7. Again, uh, rather than bishop b7 there, you know, rather than this move, bishop to b7, you know, uh, black, the, the main line today is castles. But again, this game was played in 1994, and this was, engines weren't that strong back then, if they even existed. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, theory has obviously changed a lot in the last few years. So I think that bishop b7, in my opinion, is fully playable, and there's still, you know, masters that are playing this line. So there's certainly nothing wrong with it, but it's just, I think uh, castles, to be honest, is a little bit more flexible, and it gives black, black a few more options. Sometimes the bishop on c8 is better situated on e6 in many lines, so, you know, black has a, little, a few more choices there. And that's probably why 12 castles is, is, it's really 11 castles, because again, in this game, we have an extra move. But anyway, uh, castling here is usually the main line here. But in this game, sure, I'll play bishop b7, and now white plays knight c2. This is just a standard idea in this line many times you know the idea is to free a4 you want to get a quick strike on the on the b5 square black played knight b8 here that that was definitely um you know a move that caused a little bit just a tiny bit uh of stir with the engines you know it's not a huge amount i don't want you to get the idea or over exaggerate it and get the idea that it's a tremendous fluctuation in the scores of the computer it's not it and with some engines it's only 31 30 or 35 one hundredths of a pawn which really is not that much but nonetheless knight b8 and i know why he played knight b8 there's a lot of reasons for playing knight b8 first of all he's going to you know do make moves like knight to d7 and maybe even knight b6 the idea is to challenge this knight on the uh, d5 square that's number one number two black doesn't want to get it you know double pawns the normal book line there and the move that the computers all choose is knight e7 here rather than knight to b8 white can play knight e7 uh, knight c3 this is all a power book line bishop to g5 knight takes bishop takes knight d5 castles bishop e2 and you know white can go ahead and castle and white probably has a slight advantage there that's a that's a again a, a line straight out of the power book and that's also in uh, in you know one of the lines in uh, van whaley's um, uh, dvd on this on this opening but uh, anyway that's you know all you know just a, a possible sideline there for uh, for black instead of what was played here. Black played knight b8, and again, I understand why he did that. He wants to keep a clean pawn structure, avoid double pawns. He's also looking to have a little bit more flexibility. The knight on c6 really is in the way of his bishop. So if he can play knight e7, maybe even the c5, he can be counterattacking, or even knight e7 to, uh, to b6, you know, and he can, he can, you know, try to exchange everything off. You know, it gives black a lot more different looks and, and types of thing but there's a definite loss of time associated with that move the knight was already developed to c6 and now it's retreated to b8 and i believe it is this loss of time that enables you know uh white to play his exchange sack so that way i would have probably have to say that probably and again the engines back me up on this that 97 was a slightly better move here white plays a4 b takes a4 rook takes a4 and now knight d7 and this is a very important position just briefly take a look at this and now Kasparov will go ahead and look at Kasparov's next move, rook b4. Kasparov uh, gave himself an axe clams, as did Igor Stoll, Ikov Damsky, and many others. But it's not necessarily the best move. It's not clear that it's absolutely the best move there. Again, a lot of the engines uh, choose knight ce3 there as white's best move. But it's certainly a playable move. I will say statistically, at the... Uh, you know, 2400 feet a 2400 and above. I created a special database just for this position, 
And statistically, White scores very well from this position. And it's easy to understand why. White's got a lot of threats. It's a lot easier to play White than Black. White just plays natural moves, threatening move. And Black has to play just about perfectly, whereas light, White can, you know, just you know play just about the first move comes in his head. And it's very hard for White to play a bad move in this position. You know, but anyway, and this was a brand new move, too. That's the other thing I want to point out. That when Gary Kasparov played 16 rook b4 here, um, again, you know, we have an extra move. It's 15 rook b4 in some games, but it's an identical position. We just have an extra move because of the way they, they handled the opening. Uh, the pawn went to e6 and went to e5. So we have an extra move, you know, in the, in the move count. But anyway, rook b4 at the time that this move was, uh, this game was played, rather, that rook b4 was a brand new move. And wh again, white has scored very well from the, statistically from this position. So th now we see probably the main reason that you know Kasparov you know played this way and also too um, the, the clock times here uh, a friend of mine found a video on this game on this the particular game and uh, you know he he sent it to me and the clock times here clearly show that um, you know uh, you know Kasparov played a lot of these moves very very quickly I mean he didn't take much time at all there's no doubt in my mind that all of this was prepared in advance by Gary Kasparov and his team of seconds. But anyway, rook b4 there. And now black plays knight c5. And Kasparov gave this move a dubious. There's no way you can give this move a dubious. Not enough fluctuation with the engines. Um, you know, it's just not that bad. In fact, it looks like a very natural move. A lot of the pundits said to play rook b8. It was a better move. The engines actually find a slightly more flexible move. The, the engines like Houdini, Fritz, deep shredder yada 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 all the different engines they just about all unanimously choose 16 rook a7 there for black as a slightly better move but anyway white played rook before now black plays knight c5 now here i'm just going to pause the video for just a second i'm going to stop and I, I want you to pause the video and just examine this position for just a few minutes just do yourself that favor please do that because this will heighten your enjoyment of the game and maybe you know help you out here a little bit but just go ahead and pause the video Okay, maybe if you did, like I said, you paused the video, and maybe you tried to guess what White's next move was going to be. But anyway, White goes ahead and he plays an extremely daring move here. Now, it's not the number one move. All the engines, almost unanimous, unanimously, I tested this on just about every strong engine, deep positional analysis, sliding the whole nine yards, and all without question, just about all the engines unanimously choose Knight CE3 here as White's very best move. And so... The fact that all the engines choose that move, I think that that has to be an indication that that must be, you know, ergo, the, since engines have gotten so strong now and since no human player can beat them anymore, I think we have to assume that knight c3 is, you know, if not the very best move, it's one of, it's one of White's better plays at this point. And that's, you know, all I really want to say. But Kasparov plays an extremely ingenious idea, and I really think that this idea was also prepared at home. He plays an astounding sacrifice. He plays rook takes b7, and he awards himself two x clams uh, there. I will say that it's, it's, it's a very interesting move. I don't think it's sound. Uh, you know, I'm just, just being honest. I really do not believe that this move is 100% sound, and again, the engines back me up on this. It is one of the most astounding uh, moves of the whole of the 20th century of master level practice praxis black doesn't i mean white won't even have black's a whole exchange ahead white won't even have one single pawn for his exchange yet gary and he doesn't have all his development I mean, most of his pieces are sitting on the on the first row his queen his bishop his rook he hasn't castled yet but you know and white's a whole exchange down here and yet he's never in any danger of losing uh, it's it's an amazing concept of of that there is no doubt but you know whether or not it's the best move or if White had a forced win I just don't think that that's possible to tell here but anyway Knight takes b7 and now all the machines want to play Knight at c2 to b4 and the idea there is basically you know White's going to eventually win the exchange and a lot of the machines you wind up winning one of these pawns on the queen side usually the pawn on a6. And I think that that's what the machines do, but they're material hungry. I will give Gary Kasparov at least one X clan, maybe even two for this move, uh, B4. That, and again, that's a very deep move. It's, you know, White's spurning a material gain, you know, a material advantage here in order to keep the black knight on B7, on that B7 square, keep that knight completely out of play. So that's a very deep concept. And, uh, you know, all the engines want to play again, want to play knight CB4. 
But Gary's move is 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 a really deeper, and it's more in line with his whole concept of sacrificing, you know, on B7. The idea is to try to keep this knight on B7 out of play for as, as long as possible. So B4, I give that an exclam, and it might even be worthy of two exclams there because, again, that's a, the idea is just tremendous there. And it's not like white didn't have, you know, knight CB4 is a very good good move and may win white a pawn back immediately. But whether or not that would be enough to win the, the game for white is a whole different question. But anyway, white plays B4 there, 18 B4 exclam. And Kasparov plays, uh, I mean, rather, Shirov plays bishop to g5 there. And that's a very standard move in the Veshnikov. The bishop often goes to g5 in these slow lines. And the idea is to prevent a knight from ever coming to the e3 square. You know, and but h here's the idea, too. The knight wants to go to e3 and then go to c4. Well, Kasparov is, you know, he's not going to be stopped by bishop g5. He plays knight a3 exclam. Again, the idea is to uh, uh, get a knight to the c4 square as quickly as possible. Black castles, knight c4. Now here, I have to believe that um, black played a very good move. He's got to get some space. You know, there's space time force material. You know, the middle game's about to start. You know, black's just about finished his development. He does have a problem, though. Long term, this knight has no good squares and, and nowhere to play. But anyway, black should gain a little space. space. He plays a5. Got to give that an exclam. Uh, Damsky points out, to play the move f5 here is actually a mistake because after pawn takes pawn, rook takes pawn, bishop d3, all you've done is help get white's pieces into play and they're dominating the light squares. And, you know, maybe, you know, the bishop and the queen form a battery on this b1, h7 diagonal and start attacking much more quickly, which is something black doesn't do. So, again, a5, that, because then the reason I say, you know, f5, you know, I talk about that move so much is there were several uh, annotators in various chess magazines that said, oh, you know, f5 was the move here for black. But, uh, again, you know, that, that is incorrect. The move that was actually played was a5, and, again, that's one of the, I think that's the top pick of all the engines. And uh, many GMs like Grandmaster Igor Stoll, he gives that a, an x claim. Black, white plays bishop d3, a takes b4, a, c takes b4, queen b8. Again, black's hard pressed to find a plan here. I like queen b8. The idea is maybe to dominate the a file, the queen and the rook double up on the a file, and that also maybe gives, allows this rook on f8 to come into the game. White plays h4, give that another exclam. Uh, you know, a lot of people that didn't have Gary's guts might have went ahead in the castle, been worried about, you know, their king getting caught in the center. But Gary plays h4, and the idea is to kick back that bishop on g5 and uh, force black to lose the tempo. And now black's got to decide, does he want to stick the bishop on a very passive square like d8, or does he want to keep it on the active diagonal? I believe that Shirov here made the correct choice, bishop to h6. Stoll gives that move a question mark. And the computers think that bishop to d8 is a better move, but the difference between the two moves is very, very small, mathematically th speaking. We're only talking, you know, a few hundredths of a of a point when you talk about sliding and, and DPAs. So it's it's not that big of a difference to where you can say hands down one move is better than the other. Sometimes computers um, don't necessarily always choose the better move. Uh, I, I don't like bishop to d8 simply because it's too passive, and then you know black's back row is weak and then he has several pieces then he gets caught in a traffic jam which i'm not sure he can ever get out of so i don't like bishop to d8 and the only positive thing i can say about bishop d8 is it helps black you know keep a lookout on that b6 square but i think that you know one of the ideas here white's idea is long term is to castle play knight e3 f5 and those knights are very dangerous i don't want those knights both of those knights if i'm black coming down on my king or my king's side so i would definitely keep those knights at bay and that's why i believe bishop h6 really is the superior move here but anyway knight cb6 rook a2 white castles and here we have a very important position um you know so far the play has been almost perfect i mean neither side has made a real mistake yet it's possible you can argue that maybe one side or the other maybe didn't play the computer perfect move every time. But so far, the, the, the game has been very, very well played on an extremely high level. And But now black plays the first bad move. He plays rook d2, and I give that a dubious. I don't think Kasparov or Damsky or many of the others, the people who annotated this game in 1994, even realized that that was such a bad move. And part of the reason that they did not realize that 
that you know rook d2 was such a bad move and i didn't either until you know recently when i began read a couple of years ago actually when i started on this game i think it was 2010 or 2011 when i began to become interested in this game again and analyzing it a little bit here and a little bit there but uh and just recently i decided i wanted to go ahead and just do a full-scale look at this game but anyway rook d2 looks like a very natural move it looks like a very powerful move for white but the problem with rook d2 is that using engines white has a very paradoxical move here he's a, a move that just to a human might not make any sense white could have played he plays queen f3 that was the move that cast kasparov gary kasparov actually played he played 26 queen f3 but the move that white had here believe it or not that would have just won the game flat out is just queen b1 it's amazing that a move like that usually you don't want your queen behind stuff you know with a pawn in the way here and a pawn on b4 in the way there but queen b1 is just a flat out win for for white and anybody who doesn't believe me i mean i've already tested all the engines all the engines find queen b1 some of them will literally within a matter of seconds and so if somebody wants to you know maybe you know do days of analysis and work out the perfect line 10 or 15 moves to a win a material with queen b1 i welcome them to do that i didn't bother to do that but without question queen b1 is the better move and a lot of the engines too just feel after queen b1 the mid position is plus minus you know white's just flat out winning by a couple of pawns i mean it's not a tiny amount so Rook d2 was not a great move simply because it missed queen b1, but Kasparov played queen f3. I give that an exclam question. Queen b1, exclam would have been the winning move here and a big improvement over the actual game. And now black plays queen a7. And thus far, the players have played some pretty good chess. I mean, it's, and this is the critical position here. And uh, Gary had to find the most accurate way to perceive here, proceed here from this point, and he didn't find it. He did have a good think according to the clock times here on this game but he didn't find the very best move he played knight d7 and that hits the rook right away the correct move here according to i think just about all the engines was the move uh, bishop to b5 yes 27 bishop to b5 in this position i mean that's much much superior all the again all the engines find that move and the idea here is just restriction i mean this move slices through the heart of black's position one thing that white might do is just simply bishop d7 and bishop f5 and that bishop's a monster so anyway, but uh, Gary did not find that move. He didn't find bishop to b5 there. Here he played the move knight d7, immediately hitting the rook. And this is where the game becomes flawed now because now, you know, Cheryl played knight d8. Uh, Kasparov and just about everybody else gave that move a question mark. You could almost give that move two question marks. It's really that bad. I mean, it's, it's just a horrible move. It's returning the uh, exchange without any kind of um, justification in the position he's not damaging white's pawn structure i don't even know why sure well i know part of the reason i mean he wanted to, after playing an opening it was a very human thing to do a class c player might have done the same thing after playing an entire game you know with this knight stuck on b7 he maybe he got a little impatient with the position and said you know what i'm just going to go ahead and play knight to d8 to e6 to d4 and get that knight to a great square well first of all there's a huge loss of time associated with you know knight to d8 to e6 to b to d4 and secondly um you know it it it, it isn't the best move there white could have would have you know he, he can just take the rook and that's what he does knight takes f8 king takes f8 b5 and gary just seems to be ignoring all of cheryl's threats and concentrating on his own plans and devices but b5 is good again because the idea is to shut down keep that bishop out i might have played uh 96 here 96 look like a definite possibility here uh black played queen a3 i apologize um black played 29 queen a3 again that's there's a lateral pin there and it looks appears at first glance to be a very strong move better than queen a3 there was queen d4 that was the move that the computer said is, is just absolutely box but uh Shirov actually played 29 queen a3 seems to be pinning the the bishop to the queen and threatening just to take the bishop outright and i think he must have overlooked gary's next move i gotta say that's a given because you know he, he just a looked surprised when gary played it and B, um, it, it just, you know, there, otherwise there's no logical explanation for the way he played this opening. But anyways, uh, Kasparov plays a very brilliant move. 
queen f5 x clam any ideas that in some lines he's you know going to either play queen d7 and threaten queen takes knight mate or queen takes rook pawn and threaten mate in the corner so it's a really nice little move and and it's just it just it's amazing that you know white can you know gambit a piece here if you need to see the proof of the pudding we'll just run through this variation really quickly if rook takes d3 which is losing this is not what was played we're examining examining a variation here queen d7 x clam g6 queen takes d8 king g7 b6 and excuse me that line's just a flat out win for white all the engines agree on that going back to our actual game white played 30 queen f5 x clam and black played the thing that he had to do there he played king e8 according to all the engines that again that was forced kasparov plays bishop to c4 you know just removing his bishop from the attack and now black plays rook c2 and i'm not really sure what uh, black should do in this position i think king d7 is what the machines prefer here so maybe king d7 was the move but black plays rook c4 at this point black the engines already indicate black's in a lot of trouble doesn't matter what line he plays he's going to be in a terrible line here But anyway, um, it's you know it, it blacks in trouble here, and now white just wins a rook by a very simple uh, you know check and a and a knight for it. So queen g8 check, king d7. It's black's only legal move here, knight to b6 check, king e7, knight takes c4, and uh, you know it also hits the black queen. So here you know black if he wanted to, he really would have been justified in resigning. Sure, I was a fighter though. He's not going to resign you know this early. He goes queen c5. He basically tries to trap the queen. And, you know, here he, um, white plays rook e1. That is just a brilliant move. Main idea there is that if he plays... Excuse me. If he plays... Um, if black captures the knight on c4, then white simply plays rook a7 check with a winning, you know, an absolute mating attack here. It's just, you know, it's just death to the black king and now the most important thing is simply a uh, you know a, a full scale attack you know and it, that was again another surprise move there's several nice surprise moves in this game i don't envy sure of having to play kasparov at his best but that's just an amazing move queen d4 hitting the the rook now here according to all the engines they pick rook a8 is the better move here kasparov played 37 rook a3 and he gave his gave himself an x clam the idea is to try to guard the third rank and give the white king a little more safety but it wasn't necessary but anyway uh Sherrod plays bishop c1 now here i'm going to pause the video again and just let's see if you can work out the next few moves call this a problem white to move and win and when i uh, stop talking i'd like you to pause the video and just go ahead and try to see if you can work out the next few moves by both players okay if you did as i asked you pause the video and maybe you tried to get play guess the move here White plays, you know, he plays knight e3. That's, you know, just, and here, uh, Sherov just resigns. There are actually two good moves here. Knight e3 is a very good move, which was what Kasparov played and also awarded himself x clam. Houdini says the best move here is simply knight takes d6 there for uh, White. And that's got to be an x clam. Obviously, it's a, like a cheap trick if he plays bishop takes rook. Then the knight on d6 goes to f5, forks the king and queen, and the game is over. So anyway, uh, here he played. You know, he played knight e3, and and black resigned. And the main reason that black resigned in this position was that you know white's threatening knight f5 check and rook a7 check. I mean, the queen can guard one or or the other, but not both. And here, Sherov just simply throws in the towel. And um, you know, it's just a brilliant game of chess. Again, it was the, considered the best game, voted the best game of him formant number you know 61 um lots of uh annotators gave literally dozens of exclams or you know many many exclams to white's play and you get the impression that you know white was just playing like a computer or he was playing unstoppable chess and sherov was just playing run-of-the-mill chess but that's not really what happened and the bottom line here is is that i believe that the main reason that black lost this game was that one bad move 98 you could literally almost give that a double question mark and I think the real reason that Kasparov won this game, he obviously played, played great chess and eventually, you know, forced uh, Sherov to yield. But in my mind, it was more of Black's mistakes that caused White's win in this game than, than White's, you know, superlative 
unblemished play there as white and I pointed out a lot of that ideas anyway that can go ahead and concludes my video that's right at 30 minutes and I don't want to go too much longer than that but anyway that concludes my video thank you for watching my video on the great game Kasparov Shirov from Horgan 1994 uh, if you enjoy my videos and enjoy my web pages and you'd like to make a donation to those you know things happening then please go to my uh, website that's www.ajschest.com and you can either, you know, well, basically the best thing is click on the PayPal insignia on the side there. And that takes you to the PayPal website where you can make a uh, donation, um, you know, via my email, which is to me, which is lifemasteraj at yahoo.com. Thank you for watching my video and have a great day.